Welcome everyone to Bark's Comet Riding Training, focusing on vegetation management or logging. Probably everyone knows who Bark is, but in case you don't, we've been around for 20 years as a watchdog organization for the Mount Hood National Forest, uh, keeping watch over the ecological conditions and the actions of the Forest Service. Um, educating the public and doing, writing our own comments and um, doing ground truthing or surveying out in the forest to um, see what the conditions actually are out there um, for proposed timber sales. And I've been volunteering with BARC for a couple years now doing that ground truthing work um, and just recently started helping um, give these presentations as well. So, to begin, I want to acknowledge the history of colonization of the land we're on, um, and I hope you'll all join me in this um, practice. Um, so, as an organization founded by white people in the settler colonial lineage, BARC is a part of the legacy of land theft and the erasure of native native authority over the lands now referred to as the public lands of Mount Hood National Forest. As an organization, we've established influential relationships with the Forest Service, part of the same federal government which facilitated the violent land theft, colonization, and displacement of indigenous people. Non-native barkers have access and privilege to this land because of this violent legacy. We're working to transform our organization to take responsibility for this legacy and these unearned privileges. We're learning to practice acknowledgement, respect, and su support for the Malalas, Kalapuyans, Chinook and Clackamas, Chinook and Wascos, Northern Paiute peoples, and Zahoptan speaking peoples who live here and who have always lived here, and the many other Native nations who have always been a part of and cared for this land that we now occupy. I respectfully invite any Native people here today to have a few minutes now to speak freely, if you'd like. And now, for all the non-Native people here tonight, I ask you to take the next two to three minutes to write a note to yourself outlining your intentions to continue this practice of acknowledgement. Um, and if you can just get a pen or anything and we'll get going. All right, let's start to come back. Um, if anyone would like to share one or two sentences from your intentions, um, we can have one or two people do that now. Hey Lou, I'll say something on it. If um, just I just made a note that you know when. And I try to remember to do this, but it's, uh, I wrote my intention that whenever I go ground truthing, that I, I kind of start my uh, time in the forest um, kind of with the land acknowledgement like this, um, remembering that um, as I start the work for the day and uh, being out in the forest. So I wrote a note to myself to uh, further that intention. Okay. Um, yeah, if everyone could please join me in one more moment of silence to express our humble gratitude and apology to the original people here tonight across these lands in the past, present, and future. Thank you everyone for supporting this important practice and learning. Now we'll start the workshop. So for tonight, um, planning to take everyone through an overview of the NEPA process, which is what all this comment writing is a part of. Um, and we'll look at the reasons why you might want to write comments um, and the challenges there. Go into the background of this particular zigzag timber sale um, and then talk more in depth about the terms around the logging that they're proposing and the different types of logging they're planning to do. It's a lot. Um, and then go into a few specific areas of concern that um, I'm seeing in the environmental assessment that just came out. Um, also, just want to say that I've got some notes over to the side. So if I'm looking over that way, 
that's the reason why it's not that I'm looking at a flat on the wall or something. Um, anyway, so here we go. MIPA is the National Environmental Policy Act, and it was established in 1970, the first national framework for environmental protection. Um, and it really connotes a lot of activism done in that time because Nixon of all people signed it into law. Um, and we've had it since as, as a space for public participation in the planning process. Um, so what NEPA outlines is that for projects, um, projects uh, by many agencies, but in this case, the Forest Service um, must disclose the action they're doing, alternatives, um, environmental effects of their action, and then how they plan to mitigate it to the public um, and have to include some consideration of the environmental impacts of their action. Um, but NEPA doesn't take public opinion of proposals into consideration, only facts that legally or scientifically challenge them. Um, so comments have to be substantive and critique the plan from within what it is and isn't allowed to do within the NEPA framework. Um, so to a more or less degree, you have to get a little bit technical. Not too technical, but, but it's not like a public hearing. Um, but within that daunting framework, uh, there are still reasons to participate. We can sway the outcome by um, asking to change the project. We can preserve the ability to sue. We can gather information about the project and it's a focus point for organizing the public. Um, and I know for me, participation in the process really emphasizes the need to change the greater structure. Um, so there's, yeah, it, it can be galvanizing for organizing the public, but what we have to work with right now are these public comments. Um, so I know that's a lot of technical terms. But um, let's get into a little bit more. So how this actually works is there's a strict timeline that the process of getting a project approved through NEPA has to go through. Um, it starts out with the scoping where the agency, the Forest Service, um, lets the public know about what they're planning. And then you get a 30 day comment period to comment on that scoping proposal. Um, then once they have those, they um, should take the comments into consideration when they create this preliminary environmental assessment um, called the PA or the EA, I'll be referring to it as the EA. And then that triggers another 30 day comment period. Um, and that's where we're at right now with this project. They released the EA and then which describes in detail um, what, the, what the plans for the project are and the environmental effects they expect to see from it. Um, and then we have until August 10th to submit comments on that. Then they'll take that, make a draft decision. That triggers another 45 days to submit objections but you can only object if you've already submitted a comment in a previous um, session. So commenting now gives you the ability to object later. And then they'll have an objection resolution meeting and come out with the final um, project. And after that, it can only be fought in the courts, which BARC also does. Um, so we've got about, the EA is, gosh, I don't know, like 50 pages long, and then they put out 300 pages of supporting documents, and the information is scattered throughout everything and pretty convoluted. Um, so 
I'm hoping we can get a little bit into the specifics of what, what's um, of this timber sale and management plans. But first I wanna see if anyone has any questions about the general process, knowing that we will talk more. Does anyone have a question about why does NEPA exist? When do we comment? What are comments used for? What does the agency do after they get comments? Or any other questions kind of about that process? This is a bureaucratic administrative process. Looks like no. All right. Wait. Um, there are a couple other meetings, Jennifer, but there is not a regular meeting besides the workshops. Okay, carry on. All right. So what we're looking at right here is a unit in the zigzag timber sale with a bark volunteer measuring the diameter of that dug fur there. Um, and who's been out monitoring the units in the sale since the fall and getting an understanding of the difference between the forest on the paper and forest in real life. Um, so the zigzag timber sale, can I go? Yes, is about 16,000 acres altogether with 2,000 acres of active logging proposed. Um, it's in pretty varied forests in two sections. If you can see my cursor, this up here at the top is the horseshoe section, which is a little lower elevation um, around the clear fork of the Sandy River and Lost Creek, which is um, near Old Maid Flat and um, pretty close to the town of Rhododendron, a lot of recreation in that area. Um, and then down at the bottom is Mud Creek, which um, Trillium Lake is at the top of mud of the, this portion of the sale. Uh, and then Mud Creek flows out of it and the units are all around um, that area, that drainage. Um, another really popular recreation spot, but that's not what we're talking about today. Um, yeah, it's the first proposed commercial logging in the Zigzag Ranger District, which is this red line here, um, in over 20 years, um, in the face of all the recreation, in the face of, of silent science that highlights the importance of, car of forests to sequester carbon. Um, really, instead of all of that, the driver here is quotas that the National Forest receives uh, pretty arbitrarily from the federal government and which have only gone up under Trump, although they've always been something that we've been fighting. Um, yeah, and many projects these days, including this one, highlight a restoration component, despite obviously being about meeting quotas. Um, and that, that's what's going on here. And we're gonna see that in the language that they use and it makes their language more convoluted. So, yeah, this is the wholesale. And then we're gonna zoom in first on the horseshoe section. Here we are. Um, I've highlighted all the rivers and then um, the kind of darker areas around them are riparian areas. And then all the, these orange boxes. I'm sorry that everything is orange, it's not a great, color scheme, um, but all the boxes are proposed harvest units and everything in this um, section of the sale is proposed for variable density thinning, which we'll get into later. But um, yeah, then this is the Mud Creek section um, and it's a little more varied, it's higher elevation and um, all of the red are units proposed for thinning. The orange are proposed for what's called sapling thin. 
And then this one green unit is proposed to be clear cut, which they call regeneration harvest. Um, again, this, this down here is the Salmon River, a wild and scenic river, a wilderness area, um, and here are all the harvest units. So also just want to say that I got these screenshots of the maps from the Forest Service put out a story map that I'll have the link to at the end that is a really great place to poke around that you can put different layers on and off of the map and kind of get a better picture for what's going on if you're not able to actually make it out to the forest. Um, that being said, so um, I'm gonna get back into the technical stuff now. Um, I wanna wrap back around to substantive, substantive comments and how to say that and how to make those. Um, so essentially when you're commenting, giving your opinion isn't gonna mean anything to the Forest Service. Um, so to have your comment be something that they pay attention to, it needs to be specific. It needs to reference science or observed conditions like Bark does through ground truthing um, and engage with the project's stated purpose and stated effects. Um, it's not about what you want them to be doing. It's about what they say they're doing. Um, you can focus on questioning the agency's choice in science or their description of existing conditions. You can bring up effects they didn't satisfactorily address. You can highlight inaccurate, incomplete, or misleading statements. Um, and the good news is that the Forest Service tends to leave a lot of these opportunities. Um, yeah, so here I've got some questions that you can ask yourself as you go through the documents. You know, are there cumulative effects that they're not taking into account? Um, is it inaccurate? And usually some part of the document you're going to find, yes, yes, <laughs> they're not giving you the whole story. Um, but it's all couched in technical terms and 300 pages of documents in different locations. Um, so I'm going to try to go through a little bit of what it all means so that you can more easily read these documents. What the Forest Service calls vegetation management is generally speaking for all of these projects, different types of logging. Um, I pulled these pictures from an OSU publication through their School of Forestry. Um, this one on the left here showing a light thin, a heavy thin, and a thin with gaps, all of which will be used in the project. Um, and then in outside of test plots like this one, it comes together to be kind of like the right hand picture um, of scattered variable density thinning. All of the things on the left are different types of variable density thinning. Um, so I just wanted to give you a picture of what, what it is we're talking about um, from the sky. And in this project, most, most of the units are variable density thinning units, which means a lot of different things that we'll get into. Um, like I was saying, in the Mud Creek, some of them are sapling thin, which they also call pre-commercial thin, which they also call non-commercial thin. Um, so it sounds like <laughs> they're not sure what they're doing in the future, but they're thinning these saplings and probably it's for commercial thinning later. And then there's one um, section of clear cut, regeneration harvest. The, in this sale, there, it's one unit that's 13 acres. Um, so I'll get more into all of these. So these are pictures of some units, um, the left in Mud Creek and the right in the Horseshoe area that are proposed to be variable density thinned. Um, 
they say that all of these units are dense and overstocked and in need of something to make the trees grow faster and bigger. Um, and often you go into the units and they look like this. They're open, there's vegetation on the ground, the trees are growing. Um, so yeah, this is what a lot of the forest proposed for variable density thinning looks like. This is a unit in Mud Creek proposed for sapling thinning. Um, the project um, describes all of these units as very dense um, and they are full of saplings. Uh, they're all were either clear cut or um, harvested after a fire in the last 30 years. So they're younger, but a lot of them like this one are really more open and almost meadowy. So I'm not entirely sure how this is a super dense stand, but um, either way, sapling thinning is done by hand and it's not commercial. Um, and I'm not as worried about it because it seems there's less likelihood to be able to do a lot of damage, even though I'm not really sure what their intent is here. And then the one unit, unit 129 in Mud Creek is proposed for regeneration harvest. Um, according to the environmental assessment, it's a dense silver fir dominated stand full of dwarf mistletoe. Um, and it quote, uh, is proposed for regeneration harvest in order to reduce the spread of dwarf mistletoe and matrix land allocation and create an opportunity in the future to develop the stand into a productive forest providing wood products. Um, so as you can see, well, some of the unit over there on the right is dense, is silver fir, also western hemlock, um, there's a good chunk of the unit that looks more like the picture on the left, where it's an older, older mix of different um, ages and different heights and different species of trees. Um, so I think bringing up um, why they're including a portion that looks like the left in this unit would be helpful uh, or could be a good could be a good tack to take in writing your comments. Um, also dwarf mistletoe is a native um, I think it's a fungus correct me if I'm wrong but it creates these brooms in western hemlock that um, provide a lot of animal habitat that other that diversifies the animal habitat. Um, and Bark had great, um, some great analysis of why dwarf mistletoe really isn't that bad, especially here, um, that they put in their scoping comments. And I didn't see that addressed anywhere in the environmental assessment. Um, and if you want to go after that, I would highly recommend looking at Bark's scoping comments, which, um, should have a link to. So Lou, there are a couple of questions in the chat if you want to pause and kind of address yeah. some of them. Um, do they leave saplings that are cut in place? Because wouldn't that increase fire danger? Um, I, so a lot of it is um, removing brush from around saplings so they can grow faster and then they are thinning some out but and I I'm actually I'm not sure I think they do leave them on site but compared to the amount of debris from logging larger trees I can't see it really being a large amount enough to contribute to to fire, but um, that that's my guess. That's not something I thought to think about though. So that could be something to research, yeah. And then does the project, the proposal explain why this clear cut is necessary to achieve its objective? 
they explain why they think it's necessary, um, which is they think it's the only way to stop the dwarf mistletoe and that this stand has just gotten so dense and tall that the only way it'll be useful to them is if they just clear it out and start over with species that are, um, are not susceptible to dwarf mistletoe. Um, yeah. That's, that's their rationale. I don't agree with it, but uh, yeah. So those are the only questions in the chat. Does anyone have thoughts or questions or insights? If not, I'm happy to move on and this next slide here, um, I'm just going to look at the acreage of these different areas. Um, here we go. Yeah, so there's a few things that are interesting in this table, in these two tables. Um, we see, yeah, vast majority is variable density thinning in the matrix, which is kind of the term for, for, for everything that's not some other special use, like riparian reserves, um, is just matrix general forest. Um, so, close to 1,000 acres here, 600 in horseshoe. Um, then they also are going to be variable density thinning in riparian reserves, um, which last week Ashley talked about in the um, riparian area um, talk, sorry. And uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go into that a ton, but uh, you should check out the presentation. It's um, available on Bert's website and Facebook. Um, yeah, and then there's that 13 acres of regen and the sapling thinning. Really what I wanna get, what I wanna look at is how they kind of just, yeah, they do state, and I will give a quote here. Um, that pretty much everything in the matrix they want to get timber from, even though that's a vastly larger amount than down here, the forest that is um, meant to be timber emphasis. And we can argue that, but uh, yeah, they uh, in the EA, they say the desired condition for the matrix component is to have live productive forest stands that can provide wood now and in the future, uh, wood products. Um, so they're essentially being managed for timber harvest in an area much bigger than the acreage of the forest plants timber emphasis. Um, yeah. Yeah, this, this is one of those things that's not super, easy to figure out how this this regulation came to be but this word matrix is the word that the forest the mount hood forest plan uses for areas that are designated as timber specific places and this c1 timber emphasis is the word a different forest plan the northwest forest plan uses for areas that are specifically for timber harvest. So they, they mean the same thing, but their they're definitions coming from different management plans. And so in places where both management plans agree that this is matrix in this, the same place you're calling matrix, we're calling C1 is just like the page number. It's like the section of the plan is section C, section one, timber emphasis then it's pretty straightforward. The Forest Service says all of our directions say to prioritize logging and harvest on this area. It's, it's um, 
consistent between the Mount Hood Management Plan and the Northwest Forest Management Plan. But in other places, Mount Hood may say matrix and the forest plan, the Northwest Forest Plan might say riparian reserve, which is a protected class. You're not supposed to log in a riparian reserve unless you're logging it to make it healthier and then you can log it. So kind of comparing and contrasting what these lands are, you know, basically zoned for in these two plans and finding out if they are following, if they're actually um, abiding by the Northwest Forest Plan, uh, excuse the term, trumps the Mount Hood Forest Plan. It's a stronger, it's a congressional designation. So if they are trying to log in a matrix that the Northwest Forest Plan says is riparian reserve, you have an argument to make that they're not they're not going by the, the strongest designation or the strongest protective designation. And they would have to change what they're doing on that area to make it legal under the Northwest Forest Plan. It's not good enough if the matrix designation is in conflict with some protective designation from the other plan. The way to do this is not to like try to find out all the different areas and compare them. It's to find an area that you personally care about or are concerned about and just compare what the two plans say about that area. And all of these things are in links and on our website. We'll get, make sure you have all that stuff. And in this case, I think a lot of what isn't timber emphasis is a scenic view shed. Moving on from this, um, so within variable density thinning, there are a lot of terms that describe different ways of doing that. And that's kind of what I've got on this slide here. Um, so going through them, thinning from below is the way they say they're going to do all of the variable density thinning, which means taking out the lower crown, but um, doesn't refer to the type of logging they're doing. They're, they'll be doing ground-based and helicopter logging um, in these units. And then a gap is essentially a small clear cut within the unit. If you remember that picture, it looked like a polka dotted forest. Um, here in this project, they can be up to two acres in size and take up no more than 5% of the unit. Except when you're doing group selection logging, when you can have gaps covering as much as 25% of a unit and um, Group selection is being proposed in a group of units along the Horseshoe Ridge near a trail, uh, right against a trail, and um, also close to an old decommissioned road that's already essentially a large, long gap in the forest. Um, and that's the only place I think they're planning this group selection type of logging. Um, they're also doing a heavy thin with gaps um, where they retain 25 to 70 trees per acre. I think they're planning to do about 40 um, in most units. Um, and the way I'm reading this, correct me if I'm wrong, Courtney, but that they can do this in 10% of all units in the matrix can be a heavy thin while the rest is regular thin plus gaps, plus skips. Um, and a skip is an area that's not logged. They can be up to a quarter acre in size and not more than 5% of the unit. Um, and the skips are where um, it seems like they're going to put stuff like legacy snags, large trees, any endangered species they find, those will get put in a skip. Um, the problem with that is that they can't be more than 5% of a unit, um, which means that not everything is necessarily going to be included in the skip that these specialists talk about. It'll all be fine, they'll be included in skips. So here, um, um, you can see they prioritize different features, uh, wet areas, seeps and survey and manage sites, um, which are places where endangered species of plants or animals are 
compliance. Um, and stands over age 80 are the highest priority. And then moderate priority would be patches of snags, patches of legacy trees, which means large trees that have survived the last time it was cut down or the last fire, um, and survey and manage sites in units under 80. And then the lowest priority um, would be non-listed, uh, just species um, and other factors. And both moderate and low priority features might not actually end up in a skip and would be part of the harvest unit. Um, I think it's worth pushing back here because if the, if the goal is forest health, if a goal is forest health, um, you should base that on what, what exists in, in the unit, not, um, not an arbitrary 5%. Um, if you're, they're trying to create a healthy forest for the future, um, you should retain all the features that would, that could help lead to that. So Lou, what kind of like statement would you, how would you phrase that in a, in a statement as like, what I would like you to do is mm -hmm. instead of doing this 5% limit for skips, yeah, because I know that that you say you you say that it may not be enough to actually protect the protectable things. Mm -hmm. So I want you to. Yeah, I want you to remove the limit and place skips around all features that um, that would trigger a skip around them. Uh, wording. <laughs> right. I'm better that's, at that's the argument, you know, but <laughs> I'm saying it, but yeah, is that, is that yeah, I sense? think so. It's kind of like how to, it's trying to get at the way that you ask for the change or that you um, call attention to yeah. something, something that's insufficient about the way that they're mitigating because these skips are a way that they're going to say they're mitigating their impact. Right, they're making it less bad by skipping logging on the areas that have sensitive species or legacy trees, et cetera. But that mitigation isn't really good enough if it's not based on protecting the whole of whatever it is and it's based on this 5% thing. But you gotta, you gotta tell it to them as in, what I want you to do instead is yeah. use skips in this way, not in the way that you've described, because I think that's insufficient. Mm -hmm. And if you can find some studies, I mean, the, the Oregon has so much science of forestry. It's like, we're like the forestry mecca of the world. There are so many studies going on here. If you want to find out like how well a 5% skip prescription has protected the spotted owl or any kind of feature, whatever feature you might be interested in, that's either an endangered species or just a rare feature, a rare ecological feature, you'll be able to find resources that say whether an 85 foot skip has been shown to be good enough for this species versus this one. I mean, just plug, just plug that in there. Like this science says you gotta make it bigger than 85 feet or bigger than 5%. So it does take a little poking around in the internet, but and I there's a lot, there's plenty out there to, to get. Yeah, and to, to further plug that, if you wanna do that and don't know where to start, a good place I've found is looking at Bark's previous um, comments, like their scoping comments and going to the work cited um, because Bark has found a lot of good, um, of good studies, and then you can go to their work cited and kind of grow out from there. You don't have to just sit down and Google <laughs> what's a <Yeah>. skip, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. And then Tom has a question: Is this um, excerpt here from the project design criteria, or is it from the forest plan? Or where is it from? 
Yeah, I should have cited that. Um, I believe it's from the EA itself. I was <laughs> pulling things from so many places making this, but I do. Um, no, I think this is from the silviculture report. Okay. Yeah, the silviculture specialist report. There were like a bunch of specialist reports put out with the EA that go more into detail about everything in the EA. Um, all of those are available on the Forest Services website and on Bark's website. And I'm 99% sure this whole paragraph is in the silviculture report. Yeah. So going into another what? oddity or in, in here, here we go. Yeah, so the project information sheet, six page document um, with the basics of the plan. Um, so for, so they have to consider alternatives um, for the NEPA process and generally it's no action or we're doing this proposed action of logging um, and then they have to show how they consider each one and they made this table and in no action, um, they talk about how all the stands would remain uniformly dense, would remain single story, um, ground vegetation would be unchanged and shade would increase. Um, they don't mention any time scale here, but that's, that's how they want people to think about it. Then in their response to scoping comments, because that's obviously forests grow, and they did um, acknowledge that in their scoping com comments saying, if left untreated, most dense stands would have a phase of self thinning. However, they have other objectives, including the production of wood products. Um, so essentially, we're not, we're not going to leave them untreated because the objection is timber but they don't state that um, in their project information sheet. So asking for clarification and um, to fix that is something to do. And then they say, you know, we don't have to do it because, um, yeah, they would sell thin, but we want wood products and there won't be a big um, effect of thinning instead of not thinning. But then if you look at the botany report, this is the only report that doesn't just agree with doing everything that um, the Forest Service wants to do. And it's a very interesting report. I would recommend everyone read it. Um, so here he not only reiterates that dense forests will become more open and complex, but also says that variable density thinning could have harmful effects on plant communities. Um, saying that um, with thinning, um, you have the risk of the ground cover um, being taken over by clonal plants, which spread underground through rhizomes instead of a more diverse mix of plants. He also states that commercial thinning will simplify and homogenize the forest structure uh, for a decade to several decades, which goes against what they say in the, in the EA that it will make these stands more complex because their definition of complexity is is just about like tree height and width. Um, so I would highly recommend reading the botany report um, and citing it using that language. Um, 
and asking, you know, why aren't you considering these effects of thinning? Yeah, then there's all, sorry, I'm reading the comments. I didn't mention what the PDCs are, but yeah, they go into detail about how all of this is going to happen. Also comparing the effects that the different specialists say will happen versus the PDCs, how they actually um, want to go about doing the logging is an interesting place to, to look. So I really like this example. And if you go back one slide for just a second, this is kind of like the crux of what, why it's difficult to, um, why it's difficult to figure out how to get the Forest Service to change what they're doing because these documents are just to disclose what they're doing. So in a situation where like this one, um, they're like, sure, the conditions that we think should we, should we want to see in the future would happen naturally, but it doesn't matter because what we wanna do right now is get the timber and that will make the conditions do that also. So like, you know, the, the, the thing that's more important to us is getting the timber, we're considering all the rest of it a wash. So in order to argue with this, you have to find a way to question whether or not the action that they wanna do will actually get the result that they want besides the timber result. Um, and you can do that by, you know, like Luz mentioned, um, Bark has found ways to make this argument numerous times that when you treat a forest like a farm, like a crop, and the botanist will back us up on this, you don't get diversity, you don't get complexity, um, you you do there are there are collateral damages that ha, that should be accounted for, and so your variable density thinning will not create greater structural diversity. And here's why: so we recommend you don't do, or, or you know, just say you're doing it for timber and don't try to justify it with the the rest of it. A lot of what's in the assessment is um, is the, I don't know, the show for the public, right? To say, we need to do this because it will enhance the forest health in these ways. And we just happen to get logs for doing it. Um, so you kind of have to put yourself in that mindset and then look for, and then make your, and I think this goes to Camila had asked a question earlier, um, how do you argue, let me just scroll up here. Um, how do you respond when you disagree with their reasoning? You, you gotta see their reasoning for what it is. They're not reasoning the same way that we are. <laughs> um, they're reasoning, how can I get logs and describe the way that I get logs in a way that sounds good for forest health? So that the public, because I have to tell the public what I'm doing because NEPA says I have to. So the public won't be irate like they were in the 80s, in the 90s. Um, so they kind of have created a lot of this language. It doesn't just say variable density will provide the timber quota that we need. It says variable density thinning will create greater structural diversity, yada, yada. And you just got to frame yourself with that first and then figure out what questions you want to ask or what points you want to, what challenges you want to raise. That's the big, that's the framing that yeah. will get you in the right, will get you on the right track to make the kind of arguments that will, they'll have to explain themselves or be proven that they just want the logs which might not save the trees, but at least there'll be, there's a little more transparency there. Fish and wildlife consultation. The question in the chat is, have they included fish and wildlife consultation in the appendix? I haven't looked for it, um, but I will while Lou talks, I will just go search for it and I'll answer that question for you, Steve. Cool. Yeah, so I think, 
Yeah, and I guess I'll just say that in this in this timber sale, they do try to hide it a little bit, but they are more open that a lot of it is for timber. But then they'll say things like, well, we're doing this management that's meant for timber emphasis, but at the same time, it can accomplish other goals like scenic views and huckleberry productivity, um, which A, don't talk about forest health, but you can, I think it would also be good to push back and ask like, how, how is these, how is this type of thinning that looks like this also going to accomplish um, these other goals that you say they will, even even knowing that the emphasis is timber. Uh, yeah. And so I wanted to, we kind of talked about this through questions, but just get a little bit more into some resources and places to start when you're um, writing comments. Um, and I think one, one thing is asking questions. You don't have to have the answer to everything. You can ask them what their justification for something is, why they want to do it this way. Um, also, something that Mia brought to my attention is um, using the wording, I request an alternative. You don't have to have an alternative like ready to go to hand to them. Um, you just have to say, this doesn't make sense. I request that you do something else. Um, you don't need to become an expert. You don't need to have a whole proposal that you give to them. That's their job. Um, it never hurts to be an expert, but, but don't let that stop you from writing a comment. Um, also, you can email everyone that was a part of writing the EA, all the specialists, all the foresters, um, and ask them questions and ask them for their sources. Um, yeah, and we talked about the story map is a good place to get some ideas. Also, Bark has a comment writing resource page um, yeah, gonna look at the chat here. Yeah, thank you, Courtney. Camila, I'm not. Yeah, so Camila is asking if there's a model and a template, and the answer is yes, and we always do that for every, um, for every comment period, we will email blast like a form letter, right? That you can either just add your name onto it or you can rewrite it a bit yourself. I think sometimes we have done it where like the letter part is blank, but the, all the, we have a bunch of suggested content and you can kind of pick and choose um, which pieces you want to copy over that we've written or write your own. So we always do that. But what we're doing with these workshops is trying to provide like comment writing, like advanced comment writing tools for folks to write their own comments because these form letters that we get, I mean, it's basically just a show of support. So we can put a couple of things in there that will, that they are substantive and they will likely be addressed or at least um, acknowledged, but to really put pressure on them to change the project, there needs to be individual unique comments from the public where individuals have done their own due diligence. Like that just demonstrates to the agency that they really are being watched like closely and not just by people who like hate logging. So they added their list, they added their name to this comment and click sent it, you know, from an email blast. So we're trying to kind of ramp up um, compared to other, this is the first timber sale where we've done workshops like this because it is a place that's really familiar to Portland. Um, it has this 
recent logging free history that people have really come to under um, like are familiar with this area without any timber um, commercial timber happening so we were we're like hoping to find kind of like another wave of substantive comments that aren't just copied from VARC. So to the degree that this is a ton of information, like we know, but we're kind of hoping that somewhere in this, you all will find like one thing that you're just like irked about and you'll write your comment on and that you will find some science on just on that. And even if it's just one thing that makes them have to do a little bit more analysis when they when they have things of that nature when they have comments of that level of sophistication that are not just copied from bark that's the thing that that can really put them on their back foot so yes we'll have the template thing but also if you have the capacity if you find yourself particularly driven by any one of these kind of nuanced like wonky, chewy things that takes some digging and some 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 like uh, cooking up of arguments. We really need that as well. Can I chime in just for a second, please, Courtney? So, Camilo, I totally feel the overwhelmingness of it, and. Um, a couple of slides back um, where Lou showed us the, the juxtaposition of the Forest Service saying um, that the thinning is going to increase the structural diversity of this forest. And then in the botany report, the botany specialist is saying the thinning is going to decrease the structural diversity and a, a member of the public writing a comment based just on that saying, here's who I am, here's why the forest is important to me, and I noticed a conflict here, and I request an alternative that does not include variable density thinning in stands over 80 years old. As an example, that's something that's really specific and really substantive and would just, it would be looked at in a different way than, than another form letter. And, and um, like making it small and powerful is, uh, there's real value in that. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's overwhelming. I am overwhelmed. I'm not an expert, um, but also another, I think one of the, the best ways I've come up with to overcome that is just talking through it with other people, which is I think also what we're trying to do here. So in, in that vein, if anyone has specific things that they want to talk about that have been irking them um, or questions about the presentation. I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't know everything for sure. I might not know, but we can, we can talk about it together. I, I basically just look for internal inconsistencies because I don't have all the science in the back of my mind the way that Michael and Brenna and like other like people who just people who have been around spark longer and have had read and dealt with more and more of these kinds of projects. I just read for logical fallacies. You said this one place, you said this the other place, or these numbers don't add up. Um, or something that I think if it strikes me as like common sense, like uh, Steve's, I think it was Steve's question about do they leave the sapling brush like the sapling um, slash there and doesn't that what doesn't that pose a threat that's a that's a common in and of itself i want to know i don't see that you've exp explained how you're dealing with a logging slash will not cause other problems show me that i request you to further disclose how you are going to deal with slash so that it doesn't 
cause whatever problems you're concerned it could cause. That That's it. That's plenty. Because it just sends them, it just gives them another thing that they have to analyze or another piece of information that they need to disclose that hasn't been well disclosed or doesn't pass the smell test kind of thing. And if you want to learn, you know, if you really want to get geeky and say you should be doing not heavy thinning here for these reasons, we can help you do that too. Um, so choo choose your battle and then we'll arm you to the teeth if we can. Have they offered alternative approaches to the to regeneration harvest? No. I mean, the alternative is taking no action and they, they say that that would um, just cause dwarf mistletoe to continue to spread. Um, and again, because, because of the work Bark did to kind of prove that it's not the threat that they're making it out to be, I think that would be a really good place to dig in. Um, Cause it's not, it's not a convincing argument to, that they need to, to um, do that. And I could, yeah, bring up, bring up the studies that Bark has cited and bring it up again and bring up that they didn't, um, they didn't, um, wow, <laughs> sorry, what is the word I'm looking for? They didn't address um, the issues that were brought up in the scoping. Um, and now they have another chance to address that and give a better justification for why they're doing regenerative harvest. Um, yeah. That would be I'm going to be bringing that up. That one, yeah, that is that that's one of my pet units too. Um, because I went on a field trip that they held back in the fall. We went to that to that unit and they said this the trees here are 107 or 120 years old or something and they're only like 11 inches and they were kind of pointing around at all these trees that weren't very big and they're like they're just they're growing too slow um and i was like what rate are they supposed to grow like can you tell me what's your expectation here and where does it come from that that any given tree will grow at a, a certain rate that you can that, and you want that to be like reliable. And I, and then I realized that I was asking them, they could, they, you know, the gears just kind of ground to a halt. They didn't really know how to answer because what, from their perspective is, yeah, we need the trees to be growing at like a, a regular measurable rate. So we know when to harvest them. So we know whether it's going to be 10 or 40 or 60 years before we come and harvest this area. And these trees are like, confounding us and we don't know if they're ever going to get big enough to harvest so we're just we don't want to we don't want to deal with this question of not knowing we just want to start you know we want to cut it all down and then you know believing that the trees that come next will grow more typically to what they're looking for but there are so many reasons that that area it could be that it's the the elevation it's the mistletoe in a lot of ways. It could be a number of factors. So what's to say that the next group of trees that grows there will grow any different or faster or bigger or at any different rate? Show me why you think that the next generation of trees will grow differently. If you haven't explained that to me, like what science are you using to make that, to make that assumption that your cutting them down will lead to these other this different conditions on the same area. So that's kind of what I, I'm gonna put in my comments is, it's like you're just frustrated with this stance, you wanna cut it down, but you don't really have any proof that the next round of trees will be different. Or do you? Because if you do, then you need to show me that science, but I don't think it's in there right now. So 
just looking for, I mean, that's the smell test, internal inconsistencies, logical fallacy. You don't have to know about forestry. You can just use your common sense and compare what they're saying to what they're saying. To start, you know, and then eventually you will be like Lou, and you'll be able to kind of like pick out a bunch of different things to, and then dig into them. It always takes digging though. None of us really like can write the stuff off the top of our head. I know only a very, very few people who can have it all packaged in their mind and can just be like, oh, in 2017, there was this study that did refutes this that I already know and I have it saved on my computer. And like, mm -hmm. that's very rare. We're all doing tons of research in order to produce these, these comments each time. Yeah. And getting smarter each time. We're like <laughs> more well versed in what what to look for. Um, yeah, I guess I can. There were a couple other if people are looking for jumping off points or places to do more research. There are a couple other things that just pinged my attention that I can talk about real quick. Um, yeah. One, one of them is um, the wildlife report talks a lot about snags because snags are super important for birds and um, insects and other lots of wildlife. Um, and most of these forests are pretty low in snags because they were all clear cut harvest um, in the last century. Um, and it's pretty clear that not cutting down trees will create more snags than, um, than harvesting some. And they do admit that, but then just go on to say, oh, but it'll be okay because there will still be some snags and they'll be bigger and we'll come back and in three years, if there aren't enough snags, we'll just girdle trees or cut the tops off and create more snags. Um, first of all, that will be in an already thin unit. So it's not going to be the same structure. There won't be the same amount of wood products available as would be under natural conditions. Um, so asking how going in after thinning and creating more snags is the same thing as letting trees naturally die is an opportunity um, to dig in. Yeah, thank you. Standing dead trees. Also, they're low in um, fallen dead trees, logs, and it's a similar similar story with what they're saying. And then it's really interesting, um, just again, looking at the futures they expect, the wildlife specialist talks about how in the future, we'll have bigger, better snags because we're making these trees grow faster and then they'll die. Whereas the silviculture specialist talks about, and in the future, we'll have all these bigger trees to harvest again. And it's, you know, because they're, because they're the, their justification for not um, letting forests naturally create snags is based on having snags in the future. I think asking how, like what are the plans for future harvest and how will you ensure that enough trees will be left to become snags rather than being harvested um, is another place you could question them. This is where like forest health mm -hmm. is kind of obviously a like I don't know, like a euphemism or something because they want, tr they want healthy trees, healthy harvestable trees. So they want to kind of maintain and manicure the forest so the trees are always like materially valuable or commercially valuable. But a healthy forest includes 
trees that have been left to die. So if they do all these activities that are keeping trees healthier and more robust, and then whenever a tree does die, it's because it's logged and taken off the forest, then those natural dead trees never exist and the actual ecosystem is not healthier. So the ecosystem health versus the timber product health are kind of mixed together in the, in the term of forest health. And the public thinks, oh good, you're making sure the habitat's healthy. No, like snags are good for habitat. And if you are constantly trying to keep trees alive until you log them, then there's never gonna be snags. Does that, do you see how that contradicts itself? I know you do, Mia. I'm talking about the people who have just come to this conversation. I'm gonna unmute you all. I hear you laughing. I wanna hear you laughing. <laughs> So you can look for that where, where the thing that they're doing to increase forest health is not actually about the health of the ecosystem, but about the health of the crop, the tree crop. Snags is like a really good example of that. And there's actually some baseline requirements where they, they're supposed to make sure that there's enough snags for habitat for different wildlife. And there's like a snag density, like metric that they're supposed to meet in the forest plan. And we're below it. The whole forest has way less snags than the ecosystem needs because the management has been trying to create this crop situation for a hundred years. And it's never, it's not allowing trees to naturally die and decay and, you know, fall apart in where they are. They're being taken off the forest to fall apart in like a garbage dump somewhere. So that's, you know, you can interrogate this concept of forest health all day long with this thing. Like every single facet of this thing is claims to be for forest health, but it's really for the health of the crop, the harvest. The health of the harvest is not the same as the health of the whole ecosystem. Snacks yeah. is a great example. There's a lot of ways that you can press that, that issue. Um, and just say, if your purpose is to improve forest health, but the thing you're doing is going to actually like destroy some ecosystem function, what is it that you're calling health in the first place? Can you explain that to me? It would be good to have that on paper. What exactly are you referring to when you refer to forest health when half the things you do like are harmful to the ecosystem. Oh, so it's about the crop. Like getting that on paper, having that be more visible and transparent, that's good. Yeah, and asking when, clarify when you mean ecosystem health and when you mean individual tree health, because those aren't the same thing and they use it, they use the term forest health to mean both. So we just have a couple minutes left. Um, so I wanna say, there is a website, here it is again in the chat, that has like everything, everything, everything. Um, it has some prompts to get you started that you might want to think about, some, some types of arguments that are possible in a situation like this. It has all the specialist reports um, and all these other things, the, the map, the interactive map that you can use. So. Take a look when you have some time, look through that and really narrow it down, narrow down to like one or two things that you want, that you want them to change or that you think you need to understand better because it hasn't been properly disclosed to you what the impact is or the, the, rash, or the rationale doesn't add up, that kind of stuff. Reach out to us. Um, we can help you get, you know, put it together and point you at the kinds of resources or the places that you might find the su your supporting documents and information. And also on that resource page is a link to the page we have that is just about this timber sale. And on that page is a lot of duplicative, a lot of the same stuff is there but Bark's comments from the scoping period are there. So you can see the arguments that we made in the first place. And then you can look at the EA and see if 
they fixed the things we asked them to fix or not. And if they haven't, you can just argue the same things we argued if they're outstanding. Um, and, and then tomorrow, Mia has a workshop that's an overview. You'll hear a little bit more about the different pieces, not just the types of logging like tonight's workshop was. Now I'm talking about recreation and scenic and cultural values on Friday. Um, and next Tuesday, mm -hmm. the 4th, I believe, um, Brenna will be presenting the climate impacts of the sale, which are barely analyzed because the Forest Service doesn't have to analyze for climate impacts because it doesn't tell them to in their forest plan. So they just get away with not doing it because they're not explicitly told to by their, their job description does not include that. So that's going to be rough, figuring out how to get them to do things that they bureaucratically don't have to do <laughs> is a whole extra layer of challenging um, but put, getting the comments and putting that on the public record is still really important because every time they just de decline to, to make those considerations, we have more evidence of them ignoring it because they can. What do you all think so far? What else can we provide for you? Or do you have any kind of outstanding questions here right as we come to the closing? I, th I think it was a good presentation. So I just want to thank everybody. Uh, you know, I think that the thing to remember, <laughs> it's a lot of information, uh, but I think if you take some notes and you let it just sit in your head, you have to go read the document, the EA. Yeah. And, and I think that Courtney's advice and Lou's advice is that, you know, if you read it with a, if you let go of a, of all this information a little bit and you read it from a common sense point of view, you can start making notes on on where to you know what catches your attention i mean the workshops have been very helpful for outlining certain areas i mean this is my second i missed one uh, just to leave a little space in my brain uh but i think that's really important you know to go to the document and try to read all of it or just read sections that interest you and start looking for those those sore spots and then uh try to raise some questions so I think that was very helpful information that, you know, <laughs> you don't have to write a whole proposal for the Forest Service, you know, you, you just really have to hit them at some good points where you find weaknesses. Mm -hmm. You really just have to ask them questions that you don't think have been thoroughly answered and ask them to answer those questions or change it so that that question isn't a problem anymore. And just to clarify, since I'm speaking, I'll, I'll, then I'll mute again. Uh, this is due on Monday, the comments are due on Monday the 10th. Yes. And they, and there's a way to do that, of course, electronically. Here's the resource page. Like everything that's blue is a link to something useful. And then at the very, here's the recordings. They'll be here. A step-by-step -step guide. Oh, the recordings. And then here, right here at the bottom, this is what you do when it's when you're all ready to email it. You could email it to me. I'm just Courtney with the same address that Michael has here, or Michael, if you want some feedback before you send it. And then when you before that before the end of the business day on the tenth, you email it here. It'd be great if we got a copy of it too, so just that so we know. If they try to say you didn't send one in, we'll be like, no, we were copied on the email that they sent to you. We know that they sent it to you. Um, I always save mine as a PDF, just because I'm kind of like paranoid about people being able to change my words. Um, yeah, so that's it. So I think if you, when you come to this page, you'll get, there's a lot going on here, but if you just, take a look at what's available to you here, then you can come back to it to look at anything you want. There's also a Facebook group that doesn't have a lot of conversation going on there, but if you have questions that you wanna to pose to like the broader group of people who are coming to these workshops or who um, have other interests or live in the area, they're in that group. There's about 200 people in that group. You could try to get some conversation going there. 
there's a couple of resources just about how to write comments, what kind of language to use and stuff like that. Everything you could possibly need, probably too much. <laughs> Um, yeah, but yeah, I, my, my email address is there. So you just let me know if you have any questions or need any guidance. And then I did write these kind of prompts. Like you might want to change your, you might want to frame your comments around, is it likely to achieve the results? And then how would you go about finding some points that you could raise that question about or look for internal inconsistencies or question whether they have properly analyzed the cumulative impact. Um, or you might have some other clever ways of raising challenging questions to help you try to help you as best we can. And we will do the thing, the form letter that's already pre-written and you will all have that to click on to. And you know, um, once you get the form letter with all of this, you could just take that as a template and throw in pieces that you have gleaned um, a, you know, a couple of things from some of these workshops, from some of the documents that you've read, but like you can absolutely use that so that you're not having to start from scratch um, and, you know, then throw your own like special nuggets in there. And I'm pretty sure we're, our goal is to have that out to you all next week, like probably early next week or mid next week the pre-written one. So we have reached our, our, our scheduled time. So I don't wanna keep anyone here if they need to go. Thank you for coming. I'll definitely just linger here for a few minutes. I'm gonna stop the recording here in a second. So thank you all so much. Um, hope to see you at the next workshop. <laughs>